chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Not too far along into our study. Um, Exodus, as we know, is the great exiting of uh, Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. Uh, Pharaoh had come along, a new Pharaoh came along, was not very pleased with the nation of Israel. They had grown to a large number. He looked out there and says, why are we letting them exist out there, right? I have no loyalty to them. And so they said, uh, let's, let's enslave them. Let's put them to work. Let's make them our possession. And so that's exactly what they did. They put them to work. Uh, they, they enslaved them. Uh, they began to use them to make uh, the stuff there for them. And then, then Pharaoh as well also said while he was still there and they were still prospering, he said, let's kill every male child that's born. And through that decree, there was a mother and a father who took a step of faith and took their baby, put them in a little bulrush, right? Put them in a little basket, um, woven basket with pitched uh, with some um, pitch in there and asphalt and said uh, by faith floated him down the river his sister was standing far off through pharaoh's daughter came down to, 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 to get water came down to the water saw moses heard moses and said that's one of those hebrew children and so they pulled him out of the water the pharaoh's i mean moses sister said I could take care of him for you. Don't you want to keep him? You know? And so she said, okay, fine. Let's keep him, but find someone to nurse. Do you know anybody that can nurse him? She said, I got the perfect person, right? I got, I got the perfect person. You know who the perfect person was? Obviously her mother. And so, I mean, her mother, which was Moses' mother. So Moses grew up in the house of Egypt. And what we learn about this is that even though he was born uh, this Hebrew child, and by faith was put into this basket and now in the hands of Pharaoh and the Egyptians who had everything by the way they had everything the world could offer we learn in Hebrews that even then it says that Moses were, would rather suffer with the people of God than enjoy the riches of Egypt and Pharaoh and so his heart was with his people which was the Hebrews and so they were enslaved, they were working, they were calling out on God to deliver them. Moses was growing up uh, wanting to help his, uh, help his fellow countrymen, wanting to deliver them. So one day he goes out, one of his brethren are being, is being beaten by one of the Egyptians. And so Moses, wanting to do the right thing, but in the wrong way, right? And we've talked about this a lot. When you want to do God's will, you have to do it God's way, right? And when you try to do it your way, you end up with your results, right? And it's a mess. That's usually what happens, right? And so Moses uh, strikes out through anger, through pushing ahead of the Lord, through whatever you want to call it. In the process of defending his brother, the Egyptian is killed, and so most people say murder, some people say homicide, some people say however it was in that process, whatever you want to describe it as, the Egyptian was killed and they buried him in the sand. Moses thought, okay, this is the beginning of this process of delivering my people, but he quickly realized he had done the wrong thing. The next day, a few days later, somebody saw him and he said something to him. He said, Aren't you that guy that killed the Egyptian in the sand? Who are you to judge me, right? So then he knew he was in trouble. He knew he was going to be killed. He knew that he was a sitting duck, so to speak. So he flees, takes off, and he goes to Mount Horeb. He hides up there, and all of a sudden, this uh, group of shepherds and their da uh, shepherd's daughter comes to draw water from this well, and there was Moses, and he helped them, and he took care of them, and he sent them back on their way, and they got home, and the father said, how'd you do this so fast? And they said, well, there was a man down at the well, and he helped us, and he said, go back and get him, right? Like, we, we want to keep him, like, if he's, if he's that good, let's keep him, let's, let's, let's reward him, bring him, invite him to dinner, and of course, through that process, Moses, uh, the man ends up offering Moses his wife, 
And so Moses took his wife. The man's name was Jethro, which we're pretty sure that was his father-in-law at the time. That was his name. Uh, later on in Exodus, it may be his brother-in-law, but we're not really sure because Hebrew language is not real exact about family relationships. And so we know for sure, probably, most likely, this is his father-in-law because of how the story progresses. But then, all of a sudden, Moses was there for 40 years. And he is there with his wife, and he has children. And uh, he uh, is there tending these sheep. So at 40 years of age, he did something outside of the will of God. For the next 40 years, he was on the backside of a mountain shepherding uh, these, these sheep. And so... As he was there shepherding the sheep, he was, you know, many dark nights, many sleepless nights. It's a lot of hard work. I'm sure during those 40 years, he had a lot to think about, right? He had a lot to consider. He had a lot to think about how everybody has abandoned him, how nobody cares for him. He let God down. He let his people down. He had, you know, pretty much removed himself from God, nor did he seek anything to please God, or want or desire to live for the Lord. And so then one day, he was out. This is chapter 3. That's what we covered last week. He was out tending the flock, and all of a sudden, a bush was on fire. Now, for us, I'd be like, wow, bush was on fire. That's crazy, you know, burning in the middle of the wilderness. But for them, that was kind of normal. You know, these weeds, like tumbleweeds, would... Intent, you know, sometimes ignite from the extreme heat, but it would quickly burn and then go out. This one burned and kept burning and kept burning, and Moses was around it for a period of time and eventually got to the point where he looked to the bush. And it said in Scripture, when he looked towards that bush, the word or, or the angel of the Lord spoke to him from that bush. And he called his name Moses, Moses. And, um, you know, I always find that very, very comforting because no matter how far sometimes we feel we are away from God, he still knows our name, right? I mean, he still knows all about us. Moses may have been on the backside of a mountain and nobody knew who he, where he was, but God knew where he was, right? And God was preparing him and getting him ready so that for this moment comes, and he doesn't call him murderer, murderer, right? He doesn't call him failure, failure. He doesn't call, he calls him by his name, Moses, Moses. And it's so comforting to understand and realize that our identity is not in who we are, it is in who God is, right? And so many times we let the world discourage us, we let the world put us down and we believe that we are identified by what we do or how we failed but when you read the scripture God called to him and he looked towards him Moses went to walk there and quickly God said do not draw near to this place take your sandals off right that was a that was a picture of complete surrender meaning that if you're going to come back into fellowship with me Take your sandals off because you're going to be my servant, right? You're going to be humbled this time. You're not going to do it your own way. You're going to submit to my way. And the place that you stand is holy ground. That this is a God who is holy and righteous. And he says, I am the covenant God. And Moses, and it says that Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And so we see this. We see this not only shame, but probably some repentance and some meekness and some humbleness. Like, I can't even look to you, God. And so God was setting the stage for this calling that he's going to give them. And he calls them to go back to the land and deliver the people of God. So the very thing that he started out, failed at, hid from for 40 years... God's going to say, now you're going to go back, Moses, and I'm going to send you, and you're going to go to my people, for their cry has reached my ears, and I want, you to go I want you to go deliver them, and I will send you to Pharaoh, and you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So verse 11 in chapter 3, Moses says, but who am I to do that, God? 
Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? In other words, he's saying, I'm nothing, right? I, I, how in the world would I be able to do a task like that? And God told him, I will be with you. I will give you my presence. You will have my presence with you wherever you go. And you will go and you will bring them out and you will serve God on this very mountain. Now we talked about Horeb and Sinai, right? It's pretty much a Twin Peaks type of situation, depending on what you talk about. Some people believe it was just talking about the mountain range, and it was part of this series of mountains, and one was Sinai and one was Horeb. But we know from a earthly or worldly perspective, it was Mount Horeb. But on the other side that faced the wilderness, it was Mount Sinai. So he's telling them, on this mountain that you're going to see, you will come back, and we know throughout scripture as we're going to study later on that Moses goes up Mount Sinai and comes down with the Ten Commandments right so he did see God and worship God on that mountain so uh, whether it was the peak or whether it was the range whatever it may be it's just a matter of semantics here Um, but he says you will do this and Moses of course continues to backpedal I really believe in the beginning Moses began with this excuse because he thought well who am I You know what I mean? Like, I think he was humble, but I think he was also, like, coming up with an excuse. You know what I mean? Like, not me, Lord, right? You got the wrong one. And God says, don't worry, I'll give you my presence. Then he comes back again. He says, I have no power. I can't do this. And so he's kind of backpedaling on the Lord. And the Lord says, I'm going to use you, and I'm going to stretch it out, and I'm going to deliver them, and my people's going to go. That's where we pick up our story, chapter 4 tonight. That's where we left off last week. Chapter 4, verse 1, Moses is continuing to talk with God and I think you're going to see that it went from a humbleness to some serious excuses pretty quick right like Moses was doing some backpedaling really really quick and kind of like when you was a kid if you ever went to church camp and you swore you was never going to sin again and then you go home you're like wait a minute God I really didn't mean that right like maybe jailhouse religion for those been in jail raise your hand no don't raise your hand I'm just teasing (laughs) I almost got Jared on that one (laughs) Uh, (laughs) uh, anyways but no he he he, uh it jailhouse religion foxhole religion you get sick and you call out on God and you know you make all these promises and you go wait what did I do like I can't do this right this is what we're going to hear from Moses Verse 1, Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Now, this is probably, other than I'm not worthy, number two used excuse of why people will not serve God or do great things for God, right? It's the suppose game, right? The what if. What if, what if, and suppose, right? Suppose they are this, and suppose they do that. And he's saying, what if they don't listen to me? What if they don't believe me? What if, what if they say, who is this God? He surely hasn't appeared to you. Who are you? And he's saying, he's already beginning to make excuses for things that hasn't even happened yet, right? I mean, he's like, no, I'm so worried about this and I'm thinking forward of this without faith and saying who would who would listen to me or suppose and he was given in the suppose uh act so many times when God calls us to do something that's what we say right what if I sell my house suppose I can't find another one suppose I can't do this and suppose I can't go here and suppose I what if, what if it falls apart, or suppose my child does this, or suppose this? It's like we come up with all these excuses, and God's going to tell him, he's like, listen, you're worrying about these things, and you're, these things, they, they haven't even come to pass yet. And yet, you're hindered, and you want to backpedal on God because of things that hasn't even happened yet. But you're just thinking they may happen, or you're supposing they may happen. And by the way, when you do this kind of thinking, the devil is more than willing to help you think of some things that might happen, right? (laughs) He is. He's more than willing to tell you how bad it's going to be. It'll never be the same. You can't do this. It's not going to work out. Why would you do something like this? It's so crazy. And he's more than willing to go along with your flesh and give more and more excuses and more and more reasons of why you shouldn't do something. Then look at verse 2. 
So the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? And he said, a rod. I love this part. And here was Moses. He was a shepherd. They would carry two things, right? Typically, they would st- to carry a staff and a rod. Staff was used to take care of their sheep. The rod was to beat those who are enemies off of them, right? Like a wolf or a, uh, some sort of attack or snake or whatever else. They would use that to club it, right? And so Moses at this time had the club in his hand. And he said, what's in your hand? And I love this part because, you know, so many times we think that we uh, are not equipped to serve God, but God has already equipped Moses of how to serve. And he says, what's in your hand? And how many of us think that God can't use us because we don't have anything to offer to God? And sometimes we just got to look into our hand, right? Like what's right there in your life that God can use? For some people, rather than a rod, it may be, you know, a computer, or maybe it's a, you know, t- a teaching, or maybe it's some sort of thing in your life that you have, or talent, or gift, and he's saying, what, what's in your hand? What, what have I prepared you with? And he says, I only have a rod. That's what I have. And he goes, good. I'll take it. Look what he says in verse 3. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses fled from that smart man, right? I think I would flee from it too, right? They took this rod, cast it on the ground, it became a serpent, and Moses took off running, right? Then verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail, and and he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand again. That they, verse 5, may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. So what is God showing him here? It doesn't matter what you have as long as you're, it's not, well, let me put it this way. It's not according to your ability or what you possess. It's according, it's according to the availability that you will let the power of God work with it. That's what it means. Moses had a a rod that was it but God says okay I'll take that rod and I'll turn it into a sign right I can use that God takes what's in our hand and he uses it and puts his power into it it's a great reminder too though that whatever we have don't use it for our own self and I even thought through this today and I was thinking isn't that interesting that a rod was used to beat something to death right what did Moses do in his own power he beat another man to death right so, so now we're going to see not in his power what he can do with it, but God says, if you would give that to me, I'll show you what I could do with that through my power, right? It, it's, a, it's remarkable when you think about this because so many times in our life we look at these things and we think this is a hindrance, but God says, no, that's exactly what I'm going to use in your life. That's exactly what I'm going to use. And for Moses, it was a rod. For us, it may be something else. And maybe an experience, and maybe something in your life that you think is a, a something that's against you, or, or maybe you think it's too common. Then you're not going to think about through Scripture, right? Think about how God used common things to do extraordinary things. One here we see the rod. Let me give another example. Do you remember a sling, right? Do you know what a sling is, right? A sling is just a piece of leather, right? Everyone would use that, sling rocks and put things there. And it's just in the hands of a normal person. The sling's really not that powerful. Or it's not really that, uh, you know, it's not really something that you can use as a, a weapon or a weapon of war. They didn't come out with slings. They came out with swords, right? And they came out with all these other weapons because a sling and stones really wasn't a weapon. But when David called, I mean, when God called David, he took all the armor off and all the, all the weapons off. And what did he grab? what had been in his hand right it was the sling and he said you come at me like I'm a dog right you come at me like I'm a dog but I come in you to you in the power of the Lord and it said he slung that rock in the power of the Lord and he slayed Goliath isn't that amazing like something in God's hands that he had and took from that David was willing to give to him and God did something through that that was unbelievable. Let's think about another one. You remember the story of Samson? They had come against the people of God, and all he went out to battle, and there were 70 men plus men there, and he had a 
jawbone of a donkey. You remember that? He had a jawbone of a donkey. And it said he slayed over 70 men with a jawbone of a donkey. They had all these weapons. They had all this stuff. And he took a jawbone of a donkey and was able to wipe out 70 people. Just an ordinary thing. But what was the biggest difference? It was the power of God through that one thing. That's what he was doing with Moses. He said, listen, when you put it in my hands, Moses... I'm going to do something great with it. I could do something powerful with it. And when they look to this, they're not going to say how great Moses is. They're going to say, ooh, that has to be God, right? That has to be God. That is the God of, our, of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Look at verse 6. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. And so he put it in his hand and, he, and took it out of his bosom again and drew it out and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. And then it will be that if they don't believe you nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. So he says, oh, so now let's put it in your hand in, pull it out. It'll be leprosy, put it back in, it will be healed, right? Another sign that I am in control of all things, that I have power over everything. Then, he says, if two signs are enough, look at verse 9. If two signs are enough, or listening to your voice, you shall take water from the river, pour it out on the dry land, and the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. So Moses... Your excuse of who are you and what could you do or they won't believe you, that's debunked, right? Because when you put things in my hand and it's, I'm going to do this for my glory, he says, I'm going to do it in such a way that people will believe in me no matter what. The, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters that you've put this in God's hands. So excuse number one, not going to listen to it. Did Moses say, okay, God, I'm going to go? No. Look at verse 10. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, excuse number two, right? Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. He said, You're going to call me to go to Egypt. And they're known for how they talk and how they speak. And the, all their language was perfect. And there's great orators. And they're a, a very oral uh, type society. And they prided themselves off of speeches. And they prided themselves off of pomp and, and all this other stuff. He said, you're going to send me. And I, I, I'm not even eloquent, right? Like, I, I don't even know what it is. And I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, in the Hebrew... There's a couple different words here for what he's saying here. Some believe that he said that he had a stuttering problem, right? That Moses was a stutterer. That when he went to speak, he would stutter. Other people say, no, he just kind of talked real slow. And he was from the South, you know what I mean? Like, that's just the way it was. But anyways, right? Slow of tongue, slow of speech. Others say, no, he's just talking about things. But let me, let me give you something to think about. When Stephen, New Testament, in the book of Acts, when he was uh, given his uh, sermon before they had killed him, do you remember what he said about Moses? He said that Moses was a man of great speech. Hmm. Interesting, right? Like, how was Moses a man of great speech? But here, Moses is saying that he's slow of tongue and he stutters and he cannot speak or he's shallow of his tongue. Well, I think there's a couple reasons. One is that Moses hadn't been educated for 40 years, right? Like, you remember learning in school and practicing these speeches and talking and getting up every, every uh, few months or whatever in school and sharing and giving a speech, you get used to it and you become, you become better at it. But then, say you didn't do it for 40 years, right? And say all you had to talk to were sheep, right? You ever heard sheep talk? Bah, right? I mean, maybe Moses was just talking sheep language, right? He's saying, listen, I can't do this, right? And so he didn't have the experience 
and he, he let time pass by. He didn't remember the knowledge, and so he's going, I know how serious the Egyptians are about speech. I haven't done this for 40 years, God. There's no way I could go there and give this great speech. There's a, an impossibility, and I believe the latter is true. I believe he was a great man of speech. I believe he was trained in Egypt, and he was, he was schooled in the Egyptian schools, as they all tell us he was. He excelled at it, so obviously he must have been good at it at one time. But the gift and the ability that he had for 40 years took a toll on him. Now he's saying, I'm not even confident enough to be able to do this. And not only is it just, just an excuse, but it's more of a lie, right? Like they say, you know the difference between a reason and an excuse, right? This is Moses' excuse, not a reason. I think he's just uh, reiterating here, like, I, I haven't been practicing and I, there's no way I can stand up and do this because they're going to laugh me off. They're not even going to listen to me because I, I'm slow with speech. I, I'm not well practiced. I, I don't know how to do this. But then look at verse 11. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I, says the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say so obviously on topic tonight what God is telling him is saying if I'm telling you to go I don't care how slow of speech you are I don't care how you think you can't speak or how you can't he says I am the Lord of all that and I know you I created you I, I, I have developed you I, I, I'm, I'm, I was in all part of that have I not done that says the Lord and he says, so even with that, go, and I'll be with you even in your weaknesses. So not only do we give God our strengths like a club or something we're very familiar with, but we got to give God our weaknesses as well, right? And this is a tough one. Because how many people say, well, I can't do that because I'm weak. I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't lead people and I can't speak and I can't I mean it's it, it's constant right and yet Moses is here he's trying to give the excuse to God but God says wait a minute I know better than that and if you give it to me anyways I still will be with you and I will teach you what to say I will show you the way I will empower you to do even in your weaknesses you know, I think this is great. I think there's a great example of this in the New Testament with Paul, right? We know that Paul had some extreme weaknesses. Many people believe Paul was blinded after the road to Damascus, could barely see. He had issues with his eyes and different things. And obviously, he wasn't a very eloquent speaker either. He was a great writer. But if you remember the dissension that came up, they were saying, Apollos is so much better preacher than Paul. Remember that? Like, he, he just talks so much better, and we, we love Apollos because he just speaks so well. And Paul comes and says, do you not know that, you know, it's the, God of the, it's the God of everyone who speaks, and sometimes he speaks through me, sometimes he speaks through him, but whatever our weaknesses is, Paul's obviously was his eyesight and his speech, or maybe even his appearance was repulsive to some people believed. And when they saw him, they just kind of turned away from him, like, oh, no, I can't even... I can't even look at him. But Paul says, even in my weaknesses, Christ was magnified. Isn't that amazing? I mean, when you give God your weaknesses, the thing that you are the weakest at, if you put it in God saying, what does he say? I will use it. I will make it happen. I am Lord of that, and I will teach you. I will train you. I will empower you. Moses, you have no excuse. Now, off topic tonight, talking about this, some people are going to use this, and this is, a, this is something that is really uh, something that deepens our faith or we have to trust God with. I find it very interesting here in verse 11, it says, so the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I, says the Lord. So what I want to, my rabbit trail I want to go off of is if you can get the answer to, chapter, to verse 11, if you can get the, 
the understanding of that, if you can get to a point to where you are surrendered to that, you, you will be powerful in your faith, right? Because this is, this is the one that we must look at and see, and this is the one that kind of encompasses most of the time all of our doubts, right? And so we, we know what God is claiming here is that, and through this word here, it doesn't literally mean make it as far as like he was not the cause of it, that he allowed it, right? Through sin, through the, through the curse, through the things that had come into mankind, we know that through that fall came all sorts of uh, you know, disabilities and all sorts of things that happened and all sorts of the birth defects and everything. But what God is saying here is even that, the Lord says, I'm over that, right? I, I'm the one who did that. I'm the one who's in control. I am sovereign over all things. That's the word, so, the sovereignty of God. And listen, you're going to wrestle with your faith for a long time. And sometimes, this is verse 11, is very easy. Sometimes it's very hard, right? If you think about Job, when he stood before God, this is the question he had to answer, right? People would say Job was innocent. Job didn't deserve it. Job had everything stripped from him. Job went through torture. Job went through suffering. Job through, went through all those things. And Job says, God, how about that? And God told Job, where were you, Job, when I formed the world, right? Where were you? And he get, takes him through the series. And when he gets to the conclusion, Job's conclusion is, let God be God and Job be Job. That's what he's saying. He's saying, it is the sovereign will of God. And he knows what's best, and I'm submitted to that. Even if it's something that's hurtful or painful or something we don't understand. Now, that's hard. That's really, really, really hard. But I'm going to tell you, in life, there are going to be things that come into your life where you're just not going to have the answer for. And you're going to look to God and say, I don't understand how this is good. I don't understand how, God, this is going to be made good or what all the promise we have in the New Testament but you're just going to have to come to a point where you settle in your life that I don't have the answer, but I do trust in the one who has the answer. That's what, that's what he's telling Moses here. He's saying, this is sovereign. This is my will. And I am control all things. I cause all things or I allow all things in, the, in this world. And he's saying, this is me, the Lord. And Moses has to submit to that. And he's saying, listen, I'll go with you and I'll do this and I'll take care of that. In our life, we've got to get to the same point. God, I may not understand this situation. I may not understand this relationship, how it was broken. I don't understand how this uh, defect was in my life. I don't understand how this pain and sorrow is overwhelming me, God. But you are God. You are God. And if you've allowed this to happen, it's part of your plan or it's part of who you are. I'm going to trust in your power. That's what he's telling me. You've got to trust in me even regardless of what you see or what you perceive as a weakness or something that I have caused in your life. And go regardless. So he tells him this. And then we finally get all the excuses are gone. And the true reason of why Moses was backpedaling towards God. Look at verse 13. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Moses just flat out didn't want to go, right? He's like, God, send someone else. I'm done with it. I don't want to go. I've made all the excuses. I've done all these things. And now he's just saying, God, you have to send someone else. Send someone else because I can't do it. Send them by whoever hand you have to get. Find someone else. I'm not available. I don't want to do it. Look at verse 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I said there's some fearful things in the Bible, right? This is one of these things we see God unveiled in the Old Testament, right? We see, we see the holiness of God without the veil of Jesus Christ, right? The holiness of God without the veil of, uh, of Scripture and the Holy Spirit. We see God at His core of who He is as holy, and He says He's angered. Right? This is my servant. This is my person. This is the guy who just said, who am I that you would send me? And now all of a sudden, you're telling me you don't want to go? And it says God was, God was angered with him. Not unrighteous anger, but righteous anger. He had a right to. 
And he's saying, this is kindling in my soul and, and against Moses. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was the Lord, you were going to read this scripture and say, so the anger of the Lord was ignited against Moses and he was burned up, right? <laughs> like, like, if you think about our patience and our forbearance and, and stuff compared to God's, there's no comparison. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he's righteous. But he does have forbearance. And he's looking at Moses saying, yes, my anger is kindling. You're reaching that limit. Kind of like when we were kids and messing with my mom and we knew we had her when she pulled her flip-flop off. It was like, all right, that's it. She got that flip-flop off. She's reached her limit. Like the next thing, it's going to be, it's on. Like Donkey Kong, as they say, right? It's on, all right? This is what he's saying to Moses. Like, I'm to the point now, Moses. You got me there and my anger is kindling. Does he give up? Does he give up on him? No. And he said, is not Aaron, this is verse 14, is not, and he said, is not Aaron the Levite, your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. So Aaron was Moses' oldest bro older brother. He says, so you won't go alone. I'll send Aaron to come with you, and he's going to meet you, and he speaks well. But God gives him a way out and escape, and he's saying he's going to do it. So look at verse 15. Now you shall speak to him, put words in his mouth, and, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he's saying he's going to do the dynamic duo here, right? Like we're going to do this. But we learn what happens because of Moses' disobedience. Aaron, who wasn't supposed to be the leader, ends up being the leader when Moses goes up on the mountain. And what happens? They say, can't we worship? An idol, and Aaron goes, go ahead, right? let's do it. I mean, <laughs> he may speak well, but he certainly wasn't the leader that Moses was, right? He's like, go ahead. And so they took all their earrings and stuff, threw it in the fire, right? And they, they made this, molded it up and made this golden calf. And Moses comes down with the anger of the Lord and says, what happened? And they said, we just took all the gold off, threw it in the fire, and out popped this calf, right? <laughs> like we had no clue. It just popped right out of the fire. And so as we see, this was not... God's perfect will, but obviously, he put this in his heart and said, he will meet you, he will teach, he will come out, you speak to me, I'll speak, I'll speak to you, you speak to him, you'll double team this thing. And in verse 16, so he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. Verse 17, and you shall take this rod in your hand with you, and which you shall do the signs. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go. Return to my brethren who are in Egypt and, whether they are still, and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Verse 19, Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Isn't that neat? You know who wrote Exodus, right? Moses. So in the beginning, it was just a rod, right? A rod that beat enemies off, the rod of Moses. But now what does it say? He said he returned to Egypt, and what did he have in his hand? The rod of God, right? He's like, man, he had the rod of God now, right? Like, he knew that's where the power was. He had trusted in it. He says, now, I may, have, I, may have, uh, I may have had this rod in the wilderness or on the backside of this mountain, but now I am returning to do a work for the Lord, and it's the rod of God in my hand now. It's an, I'm empowered by this. But then there's a detour, all right? Look at verse 20. Then Moses took his wife and his sons, set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. I already read that. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 21, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord Israel, my, my son, my firstborn, so I say to you, let my son go, that they may serve me, but if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Not the detour yet, I'm sorry. 
So Moses was going down this path. He's going, he's heading back, he's on the donkey, he's got the rod of God in his hand, and God is preparing to do some great things through him. He's preparing to do this great work and deliver the people out of Egypt. He was preparing to go before Pharaoh, and yet when he gets to Pharaoh, God says, don't worry about Pharaoh. When, he see, when you go back there, I will do these wonders. I will show my power. I will do these wonders, and which I put in your hand, and also what he will do through the plagues. And he says, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, a lot of people struggle with that, right? You ever heard people talk about this? Why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, when you first hear a Pharaoh hardening his heart in this next story, we're going to journey through this and see how this happens. But there's a Hebrew word that is used there, and that Hebrew word means a self-hardening, a self-conscious hardening, right? Kind of like a self-judgment that you are making this decision. So when it says the first time Pharaoh hardens his heart, that's the Hebrew word that they use there. That he made a self-judgment to harden his heart. In other words, God said, here it is, Pharaoh, choose. Are you going to let my people go or are you going to come against God? And it says that Pharaoh consciously or in his own judgment decided to harden his own heart. that's That's literally the word of the Hebrew word there. But now, when we come to this word, where it says, I will harden his heart, it's not the same word. What this word here means is that it will solidify. I will continue the path of his choice. Now, we talk about this a lot, because man has a free will, and so to speak, in in the sense of the sovereign God. But a lot of times, when people get into a bad situation, what's the first thing they want to do? Turn around, right? Like, they, they choose this path, and it ends up being very, very bad. And in the midst of it, they want to turn around to not please God, but to what? Please themselves, right? Like, this didn't work out so well for me, so I want, I want to make my choice again so I have a better way or an easier way. And what the word here means to solidify, that means to, to set it in concrete. So in other words, I use a phrase like this, Pharaoh... You made your bed, you're going to have to lay in it, right? That's what he's telling them. Your heart's not changed. You're just upset at the results that you have, and now you want to bail out, and I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to keep you right where you are, and you're going to, I will harden his heart. He's not going to bail out in the midst of this, and it will be still in the same mess. I think this is a lot to do with, like, when we talk about Judas, and we talk about others that has have rejected God and his will when they reject it one time there's no guarantee you get a second time matter of fact he tells us in scripture in Hebrews if you reject God he says today is the day of salvation if you hear his voice what does it say harden not your heart because the spirit of God doesn't always strive with man right He's saying right here, he's saying, listen, if you choose this path and now you have went down this road and you just want to bail out so it will benefit you personally, God says, I'm going to solidify his heart. I'm going to, I'm going to determine that will for him because the judgment has already been made. I'm sure if this was possible, there would be a lot of people after they die, stand before God and what would they want to do? God, I'm sorry. I see the error of my ways. I want to... I want heaven, not punishment, right? But will God allow them to turn their way? No, he solidifies their decision because once the judgment comes, that's it. There's no more, there's nothing left to turn back on. So he's saying, I will do this, Moses. I will harden his heart. So Pharaoh hardens his heart. Then God solidifies his heart for the purposes of God. That's the way it works. He's saying, he chose, he made his bed. He's going to lay in this thing and it's going to come to pass. And he tells them, if he takes my child, I will take his child. If he takes my son, I'm going to take his son. By the way, this is the first time in Scripture where Israel is referred to as my son. This is what God says to Pharaoh. Israel is my son, my firstborn. So it's a reference to the people, the reference to the nation, a reference to his people that is calling out on him in faith. So then 
Go down to verse 24. Here's the detour I was talking about. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Met, sought, <laughs> came along to pass the encampment as they were traveling to go deliver the people of Israel that the Lord met Moses, sought to kill him. All right? So the judgment of God was about to fall on Moses. You say, well, why would that be? Well, he gives us a little clue in verse 25. Then Zipporah, that was Moses' wife, took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, cast it at the feet of Moses' feet and said, surely you are a husband of blood to me. Verse 26, so he, or so God, let Moses go. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So you say, man, what in the world is that about, right? Man, it, this is like one of those stories that's like, you know, just crazy, right? It's just like, it's like all this coming every which way, right? But what was the purpose of the circumcision? The purpose of the circumcision was a sign that was given to Abraham. We're going to talk a little bit about this in Romans chapter 4, which I feel like in the last couple of months I've talked more about circumcision than I ever have in my whole life, all right? But, it, but, but anyways, anyways, I won't be like the one pastor who got fired because he decided to show an illustration of what being <laughs> circumcised is. I'm not going to do that, all right? Definitely not going to do that. <laughs> but the sign was of circumcision that was the covenant that was the sign of the covenant that God had made to Abraham Abraham was 86 years old when God told him took him out there and showed him all the starting he goes this is going to be yours and I'm going to do this through you and Moses had to believe God was accounted to for righteous but it comes back when he was 99 years old before it came to pass, he came again and said, God, I just, you know, this isn't going to happen. This, this covenant can't happen. And so God says, yes, it will happen. I'm going to give you a sign. And through this sign, that every person that's born of your faith of you will be circumcised on the eighth day. That was the law. And there will be a covenant between me and them. This will just be a sign that their hearts have been circumcised and they believed God. Now, most people say, why would he say on the eighth day? So I just learned this today by studying about circumcision, all right? So on the eighth day, somewhere in the process of when you're born, between day five and day eight, your body begins to produce, I think it's vitamin K, right? And it begins to, to produce this vitamin K, which the sole purpose of that is to coagulate blood, right? To keep blood from pouring out and it coagulates on its own so between day five and day eight they would have known that their day five six and seven this would have happened so when they circumcised the child they had enough uh, enough of that uh, in them that their blood would coagulate and they wouldn't bleed out and they wouldn't die from being circumcised but now in the hospital we we get to do it within 24 hours or 48 hours because they inject them with it now right they give them an automatic booster before they circumcise them so that their blood will coagulate. But this is the natural reason why on the eighth day they were to be circumcised. And so Moses knew this. He was a Hebrew. He was circumcised himself. He knew all about this covenant. He knew all about what he should do. Which Moses now comes and he's going to lead the people out whose covenant is of circumcision with a holy God, right? Like this covenant was been signified by this. And Moses himself did not circumcise his own children. So during this 40 years that he had lived on the backside of this mountain, during the time that he had children, there's a couple things that could have happened. One, Moses said, well, in my tradition or my, uh, you know, ancestors we circumcise our children Zipporah could have said no way we don't do that right or he might not even have mentioned it at all about circumcision probably he did maybe he didn't but either way he didn't take the covenant of God serious enough to pass it down to his children and to do what he was supposed to do as he was serving the Lord and as he should have and now it's come to a point in time when God was going to use him in such a way 
in such a powerful way that he has this unfinished business with God, so to speak, right? And let me tell you, I learned this a long time ago. I heard somebody say this. It's so true. It's that God will never use a dirty vessel, meaning that if you knowingly have something you've been disobedient to the Lord about, if you step up to be a leader or you step up to, to be something or to share or to move on with the Lord, you better make that right first, right? You better make that right because God's going to convict you of that. He's going to bring you to that, and you've got to make that right first. This is what he's doing to Moses. He's like, you're going to go in here, and you're going to lead my people out, and your own children are not even circumcised. And I think Zipporah was mad. And she looked at Moses and said, you knew God would do this, right? Now our children are of adult age. And this would cost your life and most likely their life and her life as well. And Moses, I didn't know better and our kids didn't know better, but you knew better, Moses, right? That was her disdain for Moses. How could you not be the leader knowing God the way that you did? That's what he's telling her. He's like, hey, you didn't tell us this. You didn't share this with us. And so she circumcised the children, threw the foreskins at his feet, and said, you're, you're a husband of death. Meaning that you were so far from God and not willing to be obedient to the Lord, you was willing to allow us to die? Like, that was just, blew her mind. So she just, she said, that's it. Threw it. Gone. Then, Verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you will do all these wonderful things. I'm sorry, not 21. All the way down to verse 26. So he let him go. She said, you are the household, a husband of blood because of circumcision. But here's the good part. When you get right with God, he relents, right? I always like to say it like this. When you repent, he relents, right? When you come to the point, Moses knew he was wrong, and obviously Moses didn't go against this. Moses knew this was part of his heart, and as well, he must have repented, and Zephora was mad at him, but God relented, right? That was what God said. He had, he had made his heart right with God. He had this, this circumcision happened now, and God restored back to this uh, fellowship with him. His anger was no longer against him. In verse 27, he said to the Lord, and, he said, and the Lord said to Aaron, this was his brother go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went, met him on the mountain of God, and kissed him. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, remember, this has been almost 400 years now. 400 years of history where God had not visited the people of Israel. And they looked on their affliction, and he, that he looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. So they had come to a point where they knew God was going to deliver them. And this was the man, Moses. Speaking through Aaron, right, was going to deliver them through this process. And they had worshipped God. And I, I just only imagine this scene when Aaron and Moses show up and Aaron does the speaking. They look to Moses and he turns around there and he throws that rod down and turns to the serpent. He picks it up and he does the leprosy, does all the signs and wonders to the people. I mean, what, a, what an amazing sight I'm sure that was. But we're out of time, so I'm going to pray. I will take some questions or comments. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to our group prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come before you, God. We just thank you for your word. And we do pray, Lord, for our hearts. We pray as Moses uh, sought to restore his life to you, God. I pray as we look to our hearts that they'll be pure, they'll be submitted, they'll be holy to you, God. And Lord, I just pray as we think about our decisions and we think about the path and the will of God for our lives, Lord, that we will want to be right in the middle of your will for our life, Lord. And God, I just pray as we think about these stories and we think about how you can use people, God, imperfect people, that you can use us, Lord. Now, we have things in our hand. We have things in our life. We have ways that you can use, Lord, and even in our weaknesses, Lord. It's still not an excuse to, to not serve you, Lord. 
And I pray in our weaknesses, in our strength, and what we have in our hands, Lord, we'll put it in your hands and say, God, use me. Use me to change this world. Use me to fulfill your will, wherever it may be, and however it may be. I'm trusting in you, Lord. I'm available. I'm available for you to use me in such a mighty way like you did Moses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.